we don't have time. You don't think you can do it? I guarantee you, you can. This video will prove it because if I can do this, you can do something, anything. Do a thousand things, only one of them is good, great. That one is the one you're gonna release. So, without further ado, this is what I have in mind.
years after World War II, wages in this country rose with GDP. The working people got to share in the prosperity that they helped create. But in the land of the free, the home of the great, overseen by Lady Liberty herself, how was it permissible that, although GDP continued to rise substantially over the next 40 years, more and more Americans have not had their wages increased? For most of that time, it was the top 20% who would get all the benefits, while the majority of Americans suffered. But now it's only the top 1% getting almost everything. Why? What went wrong? In those 40 years, we've all been told the same story. Government is not the answer to your problems. Government is the problem. Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. The American people can't spend money it doesn't have. That's unsustainable. But you can't expect the federal government to do any less. The debt and the deficit are unsustainable. We can't keep borrowing money from China. That's irresponsible. Our children and grandchildren will have to pay this back. It's immoral. Seriously, you don't believe me? Well, don't take my word for it. We're gonna get serious, can't we, about the debt? We've got to deal with this big long-term debt problem, or it will deal with us. But the nonpartisan committee for a responsible federal budget says, Secretary Clinton, under your plan, debt would rise to 86 percent of GDP over the next 10 years. Mr. Trump, under your plan, they say it would rise to 105 percent of GDP over the next 10 years. The question is, why are both of you ignoring this problem? And there's a good news that there's a consensus to really reduce this uh, debt um, by $4 trillion over 10 years or 12 years. But that's a pretty good consensus, and that's a deep number. But that's the problem. Our country is technically a bankrupt. But it's very simple. The government works like your house works. It's a lot more money than it actually has or probably ever will have. We have to live within our means. We have to reduce our deficit. We have to get back on a path that will allow us to pay down our debt. Uh, as we know, $14 trillion in debt is no light matter. We have got to solve the debt crisis in this country, and we have got to demonstrate some responsibility here in Washington so that the economy can get going again. We understand America is broke. What if this building of deficit can be down to debt on the next generation? Not a good idea in that. Uh, so there is an urgent need for us to contain the growth of the deficit. Our free stuff today has been paid for by taking money from our children and borrowing from China. Our rising debt level is probably a national security threat. It causes a national security threat in two ways. Um, it undermines our capacity to act. Uh, in our own interests. And it uh, does constrain us where uh, constraint may be undesirable. The Congressional Budget Office projected in April that the Republican tax law would add nearly $1.9 trillion to the deficit 2018 to 2028. $2.7 trillion is a great deal to reduce our debt burden. As to how you would go about you know, tackling the deficit problem in this country. I think it's not just an economic issue. I think it's a moral issue. I think it's frankly not moral for my generation to keep spending massively more than we take in. Knowing those burdens are going to be passed on to the next generation. And they're going to be paying the interest and the principal all at once. And the amount of debt we're having at a trillion a year is simply not moral. If to take out a credit card from the Bank of China in the name of our children, driving up our national debt, we now have over nine trillion dollars of debt that we are going to have to pay back. Fifty thousand dollars for every man, woman, and child. That's irresponsible. It's unpatriotic. We're broke. We're broke. America's broke. And yet, debt is going to be another one point seven trillion dollars at a national deficit of eleven trillion dollars. And what's funny? Mm -hmm. 
So America is out of money. The president told us so. Surely he must know. Surely our elected leaders would lie to us, would they? Well, saying we're out of money sure makes it sound like the U.S. government is just another corporation looking to make a buck, looking to make a financial profit off of its spending. Or they're just like us, having to earn or borrow dollars in order to pay for things, and looking for change in the couch cushions to be able to do so. But when we look under the cushions, it's to pay for snacks. They act like they're doing it to be able to pay for things like Medicare and Social Security. But they're U.S. dollars, aren't they? How did the U.S. government run out of U.S. dollars? Where did they come from? Most people get them from their paychecks. But where did the company get them from? Their clients. Okay, so where did they get them from? Who actually creates the dollar? Does anyone know? Has anyone asked? And that's where I leave off for today. Thank you. From there, I will be presenting where does the dollar come from, and who are the experts? Who are the people that know? And hopefully, you know that draws them in, and they want to see the rest, and then they have questions. But again, I was hoping to make a 15-minute video. I failed. It is my sincere hope that anyone in this room or anyone that watches won't fail or that they'll create the magic piece of content that will get us where we need to go. It ain't gonna be me, it's probably not gonna be this, but it's gotta be something. You know? And it's not gonna be anything if you don't try. So please, I'm begging you, try. Questions? Sorry, dead. Thank you for making the video. Um, how do you plan on distributing a market, etc.? That takes a level of intelligence and experience that like far exceeds my abilities. I'm lucky to be able to make this at all. Uh, I'm a musician and a medical assistant and a father and a husband, and all of being here is taking me away from all of that. So uh, I made this out of desperation. I don't know what else to do. Um, when I when the 2016 election happened, and half of my brain exploded, you know. And then when I found a little MMT and I found Stephanie Kelton, the other half of my brain exploded. Uh, so I don't have much left. Uh, but I made this in the hope that it would inspire others. You know? So if anyone has an idea for how to promote this, get it out there, uh, I don't know what it is. But this is not the point. You know, I want more. Because Unless this is the magic piece, which I doubt it is, but even if it is, we still need reinforcements, we still need more. Uh, I don't see us getting anywhere without a song like Jeff Epstein or Christian Riley from yesterday. I don't see us getting anywhere without comedy sketches, without TV shows, without more uh, arts, you know, in a way that is easily digestible uh, in the general public, so that they will actually not laugh at us when we say federal taxes don't fund for federal spending. We don't have time for the laughter anymore unless it's a kind of discussion. Uh, we need action or we're dead. Yeah, this was very good. Thank you. Uh, what you're trying to say is that our politicians are lying. No, I, I, I was saying that in the worst possible way, I was like screaming from the rooftops, yes. Yes, so that is the problem. That we have these people that are being known mm -hmm. to the place. Yeah, the only uh, people who know what's up. Yeah. And we're coming up, and we're telling them, no, no, no.
you know, come to the top of our gears about about self determination, but that's not what they were. There were all those stories mm. that sound good to them, but we all know mm -hmm. that's not what we want, but somehow that is set. Yeah. So, how do we want this? And my solution is things like this to work around these people. Because, because what I find interesting is that when I talk about modern monetary theory, most of the people that I get into a room with are more than happy to agree on some spectrum from a little bit to all the way are willing to accept that their government is lying to them about just about anything. But not this. You know, the, the subtle, easily digestible lie is that the federal government of a monetary sovereign is just like you. Because you understand how your economics works. You know you can go bust. You know you can overspend. You know you can't borrow forever. And if everyone, pundits and both sides of the political aisle, are reinforcing that, of course you're going to believe it. We have to get around them. We have to move around the pundits and around the politicians. And I don't see any other way other than public forums. And if that doesn't work, then you've got to do it subliminally, somehow. I'm not an expert on the distribution of opinions, but I don't know that it seems that the future length documentary has much greater chances of distribution. And I, I wonder if someone like Michael Moore might be receptive to. Uh, I would see him, but he doesn't return my phone calls. I want to take it out of your hands necessarily. I think the feature length documentary has much greater chances. Totally agree. I, I don't have a solution for how to get this up, but I, I do have an observation. So, I'm from Canada and I wrote a book called Young and Old vs. Dragon King Real Estate Crash, and it talks about private sector debt and absolute household debt. Mm -hmm. And I've done a couple hundred interviews at least with the media. And it's amazing how, when I get talking about this, and then, you know, five minutes he comes in and stuff more. In the interviews, I don't mention this thing, but this is the idea is right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The conversation very quickly, and it isn't just the media people, it's people in general. Yeah, but the government is so deeply in debt. The government is broke. And, uh, and I'm saying, well, yeah, but the government can afford to be broke for a long time, but households cannot afford to be broke. Mm -hmm. Households go bankrupt. Yeah. And that's what happened to the OE09 financial crisis, which is private sector debt. That it was crisis, not public sector debt. And my observation is it's amazing how deeply ingrained it is in people's minds to be worried about public sector debt and to yeah. not be worried at all about their own private sector debt. And yeah, and I think that video pretty much explains exactly why they think that way. You know, they're told incessantly over and over and over in just about all media. You know, it reinforces it, and why wouldn't it? Until I learned at MT, I would have been looking at that screen and hearing them say them and all that stuff, and I would be going, yeah! You know, and I was just as wrong as anyone else, which is why when I talk to a regular person, I'm genuinely kind. I'm not interested in taking your head off because I was you. To take your head off is to take my head off. You know, and while I will never forgive myself, I'm hard to stop myself, and I'm in one, so I will forgive you because I can't forgive myself. You know, but we gotta have this conversation. I need you to evolve. I need you to change. You know, or we're gonna be changing houses and living in caves. Last question, and then we move on. Moving on. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, to, to just, could you further discuss this micro versus macro situation? Um, I also think that it's because most people didn't take macroeconomics uh, in high school. But, um, so I think people tend to um, take from their own personal experience, which is household, yeah. and then they project onto larger scales. And I think this is how many people might like, generally learn. They take from personal experience and then they try to extrapolate to the And so, it's very anti, in, in this sense, energy is very anti-intuitive. And you see this projection of household, not just in economics, but also in nationalist affairs in general. People often compare 
you know, the country as a family, which obviously I, I don't agree with. It's a very dysfunctional family. Um, so I, I think it, it might actually just be a way that people, I mean, it's just people, how people perceive, like it's a progression of how people perceive the world in general. Um, and somehow I don't know how to break that change. So we're going to do solutions just one person at a time. I, I wish I had a better answer. This was my better answer, and I don't know if it's going to work, but that's why I need all of you. You know, come up with your own. Do anything. Come up with a thousand things in order to come up with one good one. You know, I, this was the best I was able to do. You know, I'm an audio guy. I'm not a video guy. I'm lucky I was able to produce this. Uh, it took me a long time to do it while I was working and being a father. Um, so, I, I can't do one video a year, you know, in the hopes that it's going to do anything. So, I need help. Professional as well as all of you guys. That's it. Thank you very much. Alright, so next up, we will have James Keenan um, discussing teaching your MT in an adult education context. There's two of us. Thank you for coming to listen to uh, Jim and I. So Jim and I are currently teaching a course in New York City at the Henry George School for Social Science. It is a five-week course, uh, and today we're teaching it based on the Mad Economics textbook that came out this year. Um, tomorrow is actually going to be the fourth session of the course, a two-hour session, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. We're going to talk a little bit about, about our experience teaching MMT and, and how it's gone, what works, what doesn't work. Etc. This is the listing for the course on Henry George School's website. Um, so I think, when did they start marketing for When did they start marketing for us? Not before August. Yeah, so this was early August that they posted the course, and the students that, that participate in school regularly signed up, and also people found it online. So, like I said, it's based on the macroeconomics textbook. It is free, it's non degree, it's just adult education. Um, we've had a class of about 25 people, and it's all backgrounds, all ages, a uh, very diverse group. So how did we get here? Uh, so I'm Adam Rice, um, studied at the University of Michigan, did not study economics, but I took some economics courses. Moved to New York in 2013. Um, I spent the first few years of my career working in venture capital. I now work in technology for a, a large media company. Um, like Jeff, my brain kind of exploded around the 2016 election. I got very into economics and cryptocurrencies, and I eventually found MMT, and the light bulb kind of clicked for me, and I got obsessed with it, as I'm sure you know, many of you have. When my friends and my family got sick of hearing about MMT, I decided to start a meetup group uh, called New York City Deaf Owls. We meet the third Tuesday of every month. If you're ever in New York, you're welcome to come. And then I also started a podcast, uh, Pocket Change, in May of 2018. Is this, is this okay? Okay, so my name is James Keenan. Adam Rice, in case you didn't catch his name first. And I started attending the New York City Deficit Owls Meetup Group 
that had started in the first couple of months of 2018. And subsequently, I attended this conference when it was held at the new school in New York City last year. However, long before that, in a different century, in a different millennium, I was a graduate student in economics at the New School of Computer Research in New York City in the Blue County Program. And as a matter of fact, Robin Blackwell, whom this gentleman mentioned, was the student advisor uh, to the incoming students the first year that I was there in 1974 to 75. So at the New School in the Political Economy Program, we read the usual suspects, only at that time, they looked like this. And they looked like this. Not the, a bit less visually designed than you will now find uh, on Amazon.com. So time went by. One of the things that we did at the New School was that we, we produced a pamphlet called Unemployment, the Facts the Experts Can Explain that uh, was published under the rubric of the New School chapter of Irby, the Union for Radical Political Economics. And in this course, we took on the notion of the Phillips curve as the link between inflation and unemployment. The, we took on Milton Friedman's concept of the natural rate of unemployment. Uh, this was a bit before all the Rational Expectations School came in and took them into the discussion of the natural rate of unemployment. And we basically took a class position uh, on uh, inflation and, and unemployment. So, you know, we were involved in what you might call popular outreach around political economy ideas at a very early point. Well, eventually, I decided that academia was not really going to place for me, and uh, so I left and had other careers, but the last book that I, that I read before uh, leaving graduate school was Simon Minsky's John Maynard Keynes, which had a different cover then, it looked like this. So I went on to various uh, careers. I worked in the printing industry as a typographer, got a master's in social work, uh, worked for nine years in the New York State Office of Mental Health Psychiatric System. I was a computer programmer and an open source software community organizer. And then I was forced into retirement in 2016, and I had lots of time on my hands because I no longer had those 40 hours of work per week to fill. And eventually, the meetup.com algorithm uh, uh, found Adam's deficit hours group for me to attend. I, I should also mention that I also began to hear about modern monetary theory from uh, the Naked Capitalism blog, uh, which I found out about because I listened to Harry Shearer's radio show, and he has had Eve Smith, the host of Naked Capitalism, on several times. So thanks to the deficit hours group, and to last year's MMT conference, I was able to pick up a thread of my life that I dropped in 1980, 38 years previously. So, uh, we have one more second. So we, did, so we embarked on a couple of things. Uh, last February, there was uh, an event at the New School, 75th anniversary of the publication of Otto Lerner's Functional Finance Essay. And there was a forum there where Stephanie Kelton and Mark Light spoke. And it happened to coincide with the day of the month which we pulled the test out to so we organized the after party. And uh, I started the, uh, uh, just for that use of the mailing list, we started the modern monetary theory group at groups.google.com and it intended to be a place where people could uh, make their first posts about MMT in a you know, relatively low-tech 
context. In other words, instead of having to formulate a blog and design a blog and go to WordPress and Drupal and all that, if you wanted to make your very first post about MMT, you can make you can join our group and meet it there. And if you come up to us afterwards, we'll be happy to send you an invitation to join uh, the modern monetary group at Google Groups. And I also attended the Levy, the, the, the Heinemitsky Conference at the Levy Institute. Uh, it's held every April. They've been going on now for, for 28 years. Uh, and, you know, that was very interesting because you get to rub shoulders there with people who work in finance, people who work in central banks, and leading MMT uh, uh, people. That's, there's the, this is the introduction, the welcome page to MMT Google Group. And there's the Minsky Conference. And this one I turn it back to him. So back uh, in the spring of this year, um, someone from the Henry George School came to the Duck South meetup. And they said, you know, our students are very, they, they, they teach George's economics there. They said, our students are very interested in MMT. They've been hearing a lot about this. Uh, would you guys be willing to give a talk on MMT? Uh, so Jim and I agreed to it. We didn't quite know that they were structuring it as a debate, so they kind of framed it as MMT versus AMI. Um, I don't know. If I don't know if you guys are familiar with AMI, um, but Delman Coates mentioned it yesterday. It's kind of a very conspiratorial take on the Federal Reserve. Uh, Jim and I gave this talk on MMT. It actually was very well received by the students at the school, and they asked us if we'd be willing to teach a class on MMT in the fall. So, like I said, we've been using a textbook uh, to build a curriculum. The whole class is based on uh, we've been working on this pretty much all summer, and we started on um, September 9th. Like I said, tomorrow is actually the fourth session of class. All the slides are posted on the Learning Institute website. Um, this is just a brief outline of what we've been teaching. So the first week we did an exercise with basically to play money and, and Legos to explain how taxation drives the currency. Uh, we talked about how we're going to frame economic discussions in the future, an MMT overview, and then also, uh, Jim provided a kind of an economic history uh, as, as much as he can in a two hour class. Week two, we moved into how economists think, national income accounting, the sectoral balances, which was actually quite a challenge for some students, and also the fundamental opinions. Last week, we did uh, currency, banking, financial assets, credit creation, and monetary policy operations. Uh, tomorrow we're going, to, we're going to be talking about macroeconomic policy and three macroeconomic problems of unemployment, the composition of output, and inflation. We'll also focus on the Phillips curve. Uh, we're also talking about fiscal policy, monetary policy, and the Green New Deal. Uh, we've had some questions about the Green New Deal. People are excited about it and have a lot of questions about it. And then in week five, we're going to do a collective solve test. So we're going to kind of try to assess how the students Take this material and what they learned, what they didn't learn, etc. Okay, so the uh, question arises what have we learned so far about trying to present MMT in this adult education context? We're a little more than halfway through. So, uh, one thing we found is that students have a range of motivations for attending. If this were a board credit course, which it is not, some of the students would, uh, the student motivation would probably vary as to whether this is a requirement for their major versus an elective course. Most of the students would do at least some of the course reading. Students would, to a certain extent, be motivated because they would understand that they have to take a test for credit. And the students might be motivated to get their money's worth out of of the course, their, their investment in the course, or perhaps their parents' investment in the course. However, none of that applies because this is a free course. Okay? And so one of the things that we worry about is that since students can come and go, uh, they don't have to attend all the sessions. They may have, as you say, a little skin in the game. We don't actually know if the students are buying the textbook. We don't know whether they're reading the textbook. 
Uh, we recommended other readings that were less expensive than, than, the, than the textbook. Uh, and we post these slides every week, and we really don't know whether the students are, uh, you know, are doing, are, how much, they really don't know how much reading they're doing. So, and we won't get any idea of the impact of our ideas until the, the self-test in week five. One of the other things we found is that, as Anna mentioned, is that sexual realism is a very difficult concept to convey. Uh, because uh, the sexual realism concept, you, know, you start out with the government sector and the domestic private sector. And what that means is that you're lumping individuals and firms into the domestic non government sector uh, and counterposing that to the government sector and the foreign sector. And what we found is that the students find the concept of putting the rich and poor alike into the domestic private sector difficult to grasp. I'd say that the students in our course have an, an incorrect, uh, unformed uh, understanding of class consciousness. Some people, some students in the class, would pose this as capital versus slavery. Others would pose it as the rich versus everybody else. Uh, for example, uh, one, one of our more enthusiastic uh, students, he'll say, all the money goes to the top. There's a form of class consciousness in there, but it's going to be a work right? Other students in the class will formulate this as debtors versus creditors. So to get them to uh, perform the act of abstraction, which the central analysis approach, uh, originated by Lynn Godley and found in Randy Bay's books and in the textbook, to get them to perform that, that process of extraction, to be able to view all in, private individuals, companies, corporations, etc., as being in one sector is challenging. Uh, so, and we don't really have a good way of yet of explaining whether sectors in, changes in sectoral balances are symptoms of changes in underlying factors, or whether those changes in sectoral balances are actually driving socioeconomic changes. Uh, we also found it difficult to discuss uh, how we know that around 1996, the U.S. private domestic sector went into deficit as the U.S. government sector went into surplus. Uh, Bill Mitchell and Randy Gray they emphasized this continually, but we, it's difficult to tie the connection between that and the financial crisis which occurred more than 10 years later. Why did it, the GFC, take 10 years to develop? We struggled to provide an answer there. And there's a question of, were these deficits merely evidence of deeper problems which themselves led to the crisis? So, we have some plans and ideas for the future, and everything from this point forward should be a marked first draft tentative patch as well. Uh, for one thing, we want to encourage the growth and development of lay political economists, that is, people who consider themselves uh, as political economists but outside uh, academia. So we uh, dreamed up a name for ourselves, the Avalonger Heinemanski Political Economy Society. And we have the Bare Bones website, which is where we go to get uh, the slides from our course and the slides from this presentation, and is the other time we have up there. Okay. Uh, we're considering reaching out to offer short in-person courses, uh, libraries, perhaps labor unions, uh, community groups, for example, We'd like to possibly develop short courses that we can present at those congregations that are part of the network of churches that Dylan Coates uh, was in meetings and was speaking about yesterday. Uh, uh, we're also considering the possibility of offering courses in a more formal online sense through Coursera, Udemy, uh, video based courses, there already are some. Uh, since 40 years ago, I was teaching economics uh, as, a, as a graduate student. I'm open to job offers to teach macroeconomics in the spring to that spring, uh, oh, there's a title that's 2000, it should be 2020 semester. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm, since I'm mostly retired, I don't 
and had, you know, managed to subsist on Social Security and a small New York State pension, I don't actually need the money, but what I, I really want to have an opportunity to teach out of this textbook. I'm not going to teach out of Paul Sanders' textbook or Gregory Manning's textbook. So uh, another idea, uh, which we were tossing out, not necessarily what we will do, but is the, the, a lot of people to consider is the development of a scoreboard for members of the U.S. Congress as to their understanding and practice of the principles of functional finance. And Derek here, who is one of the participants in our course at the George School, will now pass out a little proposal to cross out some ideas uh, where we would rate Congress people on their stance on PAYGO, uh, frame policy objectives vote in accordance with functional finance rather than so-called sound finance, and educate persuadable federal level legislators and staff, and uh, yesterday I spoke with Jeff about the idea of trying to reach out to candidates for federal level offices to educate them about functional finance. Um, we also have to uh, consider that state and local legislators uh, work at a currency using level of government, not a currency issuing level of government. So they frequently uh, must uh, participate in votes to balance budgets. So they're operating under a different set of constraints from members of the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives. And we have to figure out a way to work with them so that if someone uh, uh, first runs for state assembly, state senate, and later runs for for Congress, how do they manage the transition from having to talk about balanced budgets at the state and municipal level to talking about uh, uh, functional finance at the federal level? And uh, let's see. Okay. Yeah. So I, I just want you to be aware that uh, just this, uh, just in the last couple of weeks, uh, Randy Gray wrote a working paper from uh, which can be found on the Lincoln Institute website that begins to uh, implement this, this discussion about uh, what is the connection to state and local public finance with uh, you know, the principles of modern monetary theory. And our slides are going to be available at learner-convinsky.org and you can just navigate to the website for that. And that's it. So we don't have time for questions after this presentation, but I highly recommend um, anyone who has any questions. Very interesting gentlemen to the first All right. So next up, we'll be hearing from Thomas Burke on the science of the purse, articulating the constitutional power to create money. Constitution. I might as well get that out there. I think one of the maybe the only way to uh, get MMT accepted in government by government, U.S. government, that we're going to have to actually look at the Constitution itself. That's standing in the way. <clears throat> so first, first let me say something about what uh, got me interested in these things back in 2011, the Arab Spring uh, that was happening, 2010. And in particular, I mean, you're watching this stuff happening in North Africa, Middle East, but it was the Libya situation that sort of 
hit me in the face. Um, Gaddafi was taken out. There was a, uh, a power vacuum with nothing to fill the void. And for just a small amount of time, there was the possibility of hope for <laughs> change. And that lasted for about two days. Okay. Um, why was there nothing to fill that void? Um, where was the rule of law? When are these sorts of um, opportunities going to happen next? It just passes by. Well, my reaction was that we need a globally oriented constitution project charged with exploring how to compose or revise generic constitutions for arbitrary nations and cultures in any part of the world to prepare to be able to, to prepare for such voice in governance in order to enable the rule of secular law as a default solution. Well, how do you get such a thing off the ground? Um, we can use the U.S. Constitution as a case study, as a proof of concept, because it's well known, it's known to work to some extent, uh, to a great extent, but it's out of date, out of place, out of time, out of step, with 20th, uh, 21st century realities. Change so they illustrate. The Constitution addresses many issues. Uh, there's a key clause regarding what, uh, regarding who should have the power of the purse. This is, as you all may or may not know, this is supposed to be the House. Okay, there, there are several. Okay, there's Article One, Article Two, Article Three in the U.S. Constitution that deals with the legislature, the executive, and the judicial branches. Article One um, gives many powers to Congress. Um, sections eight, nine, and ten, in particular, discuss you know coinage and currencies and commerce and debt and all sorts of things, financial and economic. Um, but actually, it's Section 7 that deals with the so-called legislative process. That's where you describe how Congress, and, or how Congress works, how the House and Senate work together to, to uh, formulate bills. They send that to the president. He signs, he or she signs, and, or vetoes it, and that can be overridden or not. Um, but that's the second and third clauses of that section. The first clause is this one. This is the clause, it's quoted by the House Ways and Means Committee as being their charge. And it says, all bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives and Senate be proposed to concur with amendments as on other bills. Does this raise any red flags? Yes, it does. It assumes there it is, right there in the Constitution. We must tax before we do spend. Of course. That's going to be the first question you get when you propose anything like the Green New Deal. The Constitution requires it. There it is. Okay, so how do we change this? Um, we'll be back up again and say a little bit about my approach to this. Originally, I knew nothing about MMT when I started on this uh, project. Uh, what was driving me was that government, governance, <laughs> requires intelligent methods. We need to somehow make it explicit in the Constitution, for instance, that when you originate a bill, or whatever it is you do with Congress, you should use intelligent methods to do that. So a standard here is something like, the laws of logic have to be part of the laws of the land. 
So, so the question is, how do you need to make that explicit in a given constitution? Somewhere along the line, you know, I'm looking at the Second Bill of Rights, and, you know, which is basically uh, the Green New Deal in, in an original form, um, part of it. And in the course of doing that, I, I discovered MMP, which makes me very happy because it means, oh, all well, the students about how to pay for it is nonsense. Uh, we can get around that. And in some sense, so when you when you think about this constitution project, think about think about Venezuela, think about these countries in Africa, think about uh, any kind of country who is motivated to you know, possibly devise a constitution or revise a constitution and ask yourself, how would you do that knowing what the MNT says? How would you write a constitution that incorporates the principles of the MNT? Uh, that's what I mean by point two here. You need to make those kinds of things explicit in any such revision. So our original clause 171 fails on both of these counts. Um, there's nothing there about logic. There's nothing there about intelligent method. Um, and yet, it's obviously required intelligence and government. Um, but there's also, as I pointed out, the, the very fact that, that you're talking about bills that raise revenue. So revenue is required for spending that needs to be cleaned up. So here's my, here's my suggestion on how to revise that one clause. And I've, I've used some color coding here to identify where does the logic come in and where is the MMT coming in. So this blue part, and I've, I've done this actually for the whole constitution. Right? You can't just do it here. You know, there's every clause depends on every other clause, and you have to constantly be reiterating these kinds of things. But the first thing to uh, note here. Consistent with scientifically warranted economic principles. Put that in here. All bills for not raising revenue. All bills for deploying the nation's available productivity resources shall originate in the House of Representatives and the Senate can add their two cents. Um, now, you know, the claim is here is that one of many, this is just one of many clauses in the Constitution and uh, that need to be revisited and revised. Uh, the whole thing needs to be cleaned up. But if you don't do something like this, you're beating your head against the wall, um, ultimately, by trying to. Well, I would say, in response to an earlier comment, it's not that our congressmen, the senators, the president, or these half presidents are liars. They're incompetent. They just don't understand. Okay? And they're listening to their advisors, and they're listening to uh, there's a lot of liars in the county in the halls of power. But I think many of our representatives are the officers of government simply don't understand the personality of the party, the party line, and that's why a lot of this stuff just simply needs to be made um, explicit in the Constitution somewhere. Um, and that's it. Time for one or two questions. Yes. How much traction have you gotten on this so far? 
How much what? Traction. Like, have, has there been support for actually voting and changing the Constitution? Any public? Absolutely zero. This is the first time you're presenting? Uh, this is the first time I've presented this in, in public, yes. Thank um, you. And, I mean, I have, I mean, I, I, I've, I've revised the whole thing in ways that make sense to me, and I've tried to explain what I've done. Uh, and in particular, I've tried to not have a little appendix that here's what MMT is, and uh, that's not quite finished yet. But uh, no, it's just the first time I've put it out. Thank you so much. This is extremely crucial. I just want to say, Carmen, I think the person you should talk to is Joe Pires. It's probably has a lot of knowledge of the career writing subject. I, I can't agree with you. I think, that, I think you should consider contacting Joe Firestone. I have a feeling that he would be very helpful with um, making this even more you know, tight now. Thank you. So um, at this point, we have to move on. Another round of applause. For <laughs> And the final talk of this public forum, the Royal Women's Women's Format, will be delivered by Mike Feldman. Um, he'll be talking about using in, in international, international payroll data to develop interest rate and debt connection. Can't hear you. Pick up the mic. Also very tall. <laughs> um, so uh, yesterday, like yeah, you get. Uh, 
Uh, you get scared that the government's not going to not going to pay its debts. Um, and certainly that would apply to governments issuing debts uh, from currencies that they don't control. Um, I guess kind of the second uh, other academic uh, view on, on this is to try to treat it solely as an empirical question, which is basically, well, let's just look at uh, uh, data from financial markets and macroeconomic variables and runs for regressions and see if we find a connection. Um, I've certainly had uh, discussions with authors of uh, papers uh, along those lines, uh, specifically Gail Norzeg, uh, Ernie Tedeschi, uh, and some others, and they're not interested, in general, this part of the field is not interested in discussing uh, theory, they just say, well, this is a empirical question and we think we control for enough variables. Uh, so we're confident in saying that, you know, the, you know, whatever the deficit or the dead stock variable we had in our aggression came out of significance, so we're satisfied. They don't really think about mechanisms. Uh, the danger of that, of course, is you really don't know what you don't know. And so you, if you don't know what you're controlling for, what to control for, you can obviously get uh, spurious correlations where it is very incorrect to draw a causal inference from. Um, I guess I have my slides, I would say I make the point like Gail and Orzak specifically have a bunch of really weird control variables in their in their regressions, one being like defense spending to GDP. And again, this is they're trying to uh, you know figure out what's driving long-term bond yields. Well, I, I, I don't know why, what would be the financial mechanism for why if you had a deficit caused by defense spending that would drive up interest rates more or less than, you know, assuming you believe that debt hacked up interest rates and you know, you have the government buy widget factories or do a green new deal or whatever. So that's like the fact that you're kind of just throwing everything at the wall, that's kind of one of the things that have problem with those, some of those studies is they're just kind of throwing everything at the wall and hoping something sticks. Um, so uh, what I did is I said, all right, I want to use, I want to take international data because also those, all those studies are very US centric. So they're only really looking at data from the United States. I said, I want to take international data. Um, there have been some studies that have looked at international data. Unfortunately, they're grouping together countries that uh, borrowing their own free-floating currency in countries that don't. So that's again another problem. So I said I want to pick eight countries or nine countries. They all issue in their own currency. I want to get bond yields uh, in their own currency. They have their own central banks, so they set their own short-term interest rates. And there's a uh, you know pretty consistent, reliable um, macroeconomic data. Uh, so I can test whether or not you know, these assertions that the public debt stock drives up interest rates um, is, uh, is true or not. Um, and anyway, so I did both a fixed effects and random effects panel regression, and uh, the countries I used were um, the United States, UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Switzerland, Japan, uh, Sweden, and Norway. So all, uh, monetarily sovereign governments, which um, all of those except for the UK uh, issue uh, and Sweden issue exclusively in their own currencies and um, the, the stock of foreign nominated debt for UK and Sweden are negligible. So relative to the debt stock and uh, the national currencies. And um, so the spoiler alert is that when you control for uh, short-term interest rates, uh, growth, growth rates, um, volatility, um, and uh, 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 sorry, um, uh, demographics. That's one thing that uh, that that has been asserted that neither debt nor uh, or democratic, demographics are uh, really materially driving 
long term interest rates to get into the coefficients come back as insignificant. Um, interestingly, uh, productivity growth um, is, is significant. It's like a 1% increase in productive, labor productivity growth uh, is on average uh, connected with like a 13 basis point rise in long term bond yields after adjusting for again short term interest rates, growth rates, all to the new all those other variables. And I suspect that's a spurious correlation for some sort of spoiler thing. I don't want to draw a positive inference there, but I really uh, I, I couldn't uh, really come up with other control variables that I thought might make that go away. It's part of the reason I was curious that in the audience would have a suggestion on that. Yeah, that's my answer. Thank you. I just watched Jeff do his presentation about inspiring young people to create, and about 20 minutes ago I wrote this poem, which basically summarizes my experience at this conference. Thank God. I know. <laughs> that fast. Do you ever wonder how bold are the lies that exit the mouths of our fellow allies? They're paid to continue their sad little tries in order to get us to give up our rights. The bolder the lie, the more they will get, by saying that spending resulting in debt. The debt is a ledger, it's simple spreadsheets, containing decisions of wealthy elites. I know it's our money, and now it is time to rid of the liars and take what is mine. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. So um, we're now going to move into about a five to ten minute uh, technical.